In this tutorial, we're going to learn to knit these shaker dishcloths look like this. The pattern also includes instructions for making coasters. And I got the idea for this pattern, I was recently reading A History of Hand Knitting by Richard Rutt. And I'll give you a link to this book in the video description below. And in this book, he's, uh, I'm up to the part in history where he's describing colonial American shakers. And he describes what they knit as being on teeny tiny needles, size US zero or two millimeter needles, or even smaller than that, and doing really tiny knitting to make these segmented dishcloths. And I'll tell you exactly what he says. He says, the washcloths were circular, made of 16 segments of garter stitch, arranged in alternating colors. The rows ran radially, decreasing from the center in alternate short shortened rows. And at the time, I was actually sick. I had a fever. But I read those two lines, and I wanted to modernize this pattern and make it friendly for modern knitters. And so I got to work. I used much bigger needles. We used size 5 needles for this. And uh, friendlier yarn. This is worsted weight yarn. Of course, very soft, modern yarn. And um, I made it, I updated it with just 12 segments instead of 16. I also added a pico edge for a little bit of interest and wrote it all out in the pattern. And if you'd like to get your copy of the pattern to follow along with this tutorial, just follow the link in the video description below. I'll also give you a link here on screen to my website. The pattern includes dishcloths with a pico edge, dishcloths without a pico edge, the coasters, and then some um, information on modifying the pattern to make any kind of, any size circle that you want. And I'll tell you these, uh, I have a drawer full of hand knitted dishcloths, but I rarely actually use them to wash dishes. Um, I use my kitchen scrubby pattern for washing dishes, and I'll give you a link to that as well. Uh, I use these kind of for everything else in the name of, um, creating less garbage and running a greener household. I use these for drying my hands, wiping up spills. I also use them as, um, I fold them over, use them as hot pads, I use them as trivets. I have a drawer full and they're constantly being thrown in the washing machine and pulled out and I do create less trash that way. I'm excited to see what you all do with this pattern and the color combinations you choose or how you choose to put them together because the pattern is easy to modify. Um, so first up, we're going to get started with the provisional cast on, knitting the short rows. Don't worry, there are no picking up wraps in these. We're just going to work short rows. And changing colors. If you have your pattern and your needles and your yarn, you're ready to get started. We're going to start with um, the provisional cast on and knitting the segments of the dishcloth. But first, let me show you what you're in for and what the pattern gives you. Let's take a look. Here is the dishcloth that I started with, 12 segments and a pico edge. And it looks really different in different colors. I'm excited to see what colors you guys come up with for this. And here it is. The pattern also gives you instructions for this. This is the same dishcloth with no pico edge. And that one looks like a Christmas candy. Okay. The pattern also gives you the instructions for these coasters. These work up really quickly because they're not very big at all. And instructions for a coaster with a pico edge. And I don't have a sample here, but the pattern also gives you instructions for a smaller dishcloth. Oh, I think I've covered every possible base for you guys. So to get started with the pattern, we're going to make a provisional cast on. And the provisional cast on allows us to uh, completely hide the cast on and bind off. You can't tell that there's anything going on any differently here from one segment to the next. And here's the back of the work. I neglected to show you this before. Um, to do this, you need a crochet hook and yarn that is not the color of the dishcloth. This needs to be a different color so you can see what you're doing. And I always start by tying a knot, just something that I can feel in the yarn, because I want to be able to distinguish my slip knot end from the non-slip knot end. So I started with a slip knot, and I'm going to crochet chain. You don't really have to know how to crochet to do this, but uh, because it's just a simple chain, grabbing the yarn and pulling it through each loop. 
But if you need a slower review of this, I will give you a link to my crochet chain video right here. You're going to follow the pattern to chain as many as it tells you to for the size that you're knitting and break the yarn. Pull that last end through to fasten it. There's our crochet chain. This is what is considered the top of the crochet chain. It looks like a bind off row, it's a bunch of V's. To do the provisional cast on, we're going to work into the back of the crochet chain where it's what I call the hyphens. It's also called the spine of the crochet chain. There are these little horizontal loops in the very center and that's what we're going to pick up to knit to make the provisional cast on. What you want to do is have the uh, slip knot end, the end with the knot in it, over on the right side. We're going to work from the right to the left with the slip knot side over here. So now you want to grab the first color of yarn you are using in your dishcloth. In the crochet chain, in the pattern, I have you crochet chaining more chain stitches than you actually need. So you don't need to go in the very first hyphen. You can skip one or two. I've given you that leeway there. So put your needle, you only need one needle for this. Put it under the first hyphen, grab your yarn, and fold it over leaving about a six inch tail. We're going to use that loop you just created to wrap the needle and pull it through. You can drop the tail in now, take a look at your crochet chain, and go into the second hyphen. And just keep picking up the hyphens all the way in the back of the crochet chain, following your pattern for the number that you need. And of course, I'm using super bulky yarn, not super bulky, bulky yarn, huge needles, so it's very easy to see what I'm doing. It'll be a little more challenging with the smaller needles, but it's not hard. Okay, after you have the correct number and the provisional cast on, you're ready to start row one. And if you are doing the dishcloth with the Pico Edge, the pattern is written in clusters of four rows because each four rows gives you one pico at the edge of the work. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate now. The, the numbers that I'm using here don't match the pattern because of the size needles and yarn I'm using, but the technique is the same and that's what I want to demonstrate. So you'll start knitting and follow your pattern up to the number of stitches it tells you to knit because you won't be knitting to the end on row one. You'll be knitting up to the number it tells you to knit and then it says turn, which means you have not knit to the end, you still have stitches over here on the left needle and you're going to turn the work. So when you turn the work it means put the needle that was in your left hand in your right hand, the needle was in your right hand in your left hand and you have turned. You put the yarn to the back at that point, it was in the front because you just uh, turn the work, put that yarn to the back and you want to slip the first stitch without working it. We're on row two now. Slip the first stitch and then knit up to the last two stitches. Okay, so once you get to the last two stitches, you're going to increase in each one of these stitches using a KFB or knit front back stitch. I'll demonstrate this for you. You go in, and work the first stitch for, as a knit stitch, but don't take that old stitch off the left needle. Instead, swing the tip of your needle around and put it in the back loop of that stitch, wrap it and pull it through, then pull the old stitch off the left needle, and you have two stitches where you had one before. We're gonna do the same thing to the next stitch. Do a normal knit stitch, swing the tip of your needle around to the back loop of that same stitch, wrap it and pull it through. So we've just increased by two, and that's the first row of the provisional cast on. 
Now this is the second row of the provisional cast on where we actually make the, uh, not provisional cast on, pico edge. Okay, that was the first row, here's the second row of the pico edge. You start by slipping a stitch, you slip it, you go in as if to purl, don't work that stitch, and we're going to knit the next stitch. Okay, you have two stitches on the left needle. We're going to do a PSSO, which stands for Pass Slipped Stitch Over. We're going to grab onto this slip stitch and pass it over the end of the needle over this stitch, like binding off, which will decrease the stitch count by one. Okay, so now you have one stitch on the left needle. Pull the yarn forward between the two needles and purl one. And then pass that knit stitch over the purl stitch. That is it. That gives us the pico edge. Then you're going to follow the instructions to knit as many stitches as you need to in this next part. Um, and you'll turn the work again and finish up that row that way. I am going to jump right into the color change row. Once you've worked um, however many pico edge stitches for the size that you're knitting, you will have completed a segment and you'll be ready to work a color change. And I want to show you how to do that. Okay. Because each segment is, it comes to a point at the very center, the yarn doesn't have to travel very far uh, if you keep the each color attached throughout the whole project. So when I was making this one, I had the green and the white attached the whole time because the floats that you make, you know, floating from this segment to this segment with the green or this segment to this segment with the white is so tiny, there's no reason to break the yarn each time and reattach it. You can just keep it hanging there. But for the first color chain that you do, color change that you do, you do have to attach the new color of yarn. I'm going to use this green color now. And I am at the center of the, the circle right now. I mean, clearly I haven't finished a segment. I put my needle into the next stitch, and this is just like when we were starting the provisional cast on. Fold your yarn over, leaving about a six inch tail. Take that loop, wrap the needle, and pull it through. You've just changed color. Put your needle in, wrap the yarn and pull it through. You're done, this is a new color now. And usually what I'll do is knit a few stitches or across the row. And then I will go back and find my two short ends. And this is the dishcloth that's going in the washing machine and the dryer. And we want to make sure that nothing is ever going to come unraveled here. There's no shame in tying knots. Taking the two short ends and tying a good knot. And on the second half of the double knot, really pull it tightly. Like, pay attention to what you're doing and pull it so tightly, just shy of breaking the yarn. And once you've done that, you have a really secure knot that isn't going to come apart in the wash. We're going to talk about weaving these ends in later. For now, those can just hang there. So those are the techniques you need for knitting the segments. You'll follow your pattern and knit each segment in the same way until you get to the very end. And next up, we're going to talk about unzipping the provisional cast on and the Kitchener stitch. Okay, we're ready to pick up on instruction for when you have knit all the segments and you're wondering how to attach one side to the other and do the finishing work. So the first thing we're going to do is unzip the provisional cast on. Let's take a look. Okay, as I've said before, this is a very bulky sample, so none of the numbers match, but the technique is going to be the same. And I did my provisional cast on chain in this gray yarn and that's what I'm going to focus on right now. Remember we tied the knot to <clears throat> distinguish the slip knot end from the non-slip knot end? The knot should now be on the inside of the circle. If it's not, don't panic. But following the pattern and getting every row correct, your knot will be on the inside of the circle. We're going to start on the outside of the circle where there is no knot, the non-slip knot end, and we're going to start unzipping from here. 
When we fastened this crochet chain off, we just pulled the last end through the last loop. So I'm going to undo that, which will allow me to unravel this, you see. I'm going to unravel it right down to the end here. And the first provisional cast on stitch that we're going to pick up is usually different from all the rest. And mine actually goes through and around a couple of things. I'm just going to carefully pick it out. There's my stitch. And the, the gray yarn actually goes through my stitch. This is the only stitch it'll do it for. I'm going to put my needle into that stitch and pull the yarn out. Okay, there's my first stitch. The rest of it will be easier. I always do one stitch at a time to make sure that I don't lose anything. I'm going to stretch this out a bit so you can really see it. Just below the provisional cast on, you'll see a V. You want to go behind the, the right leg of the V, like this, and then pop out the next stitch. Give it a stretch, go behind the right leg of the V, from back to front, pop out the next stitch. If you go back to front like this, it will get your stitches mounted correctly on the needle because you want the right leg in front and the left leg in back. Slow and steady. Okay. You'll count your stitches to make sure you have the correct number, you didn't miss anything. And then, because I'm such a fanatic about tying knots and things, the provisional cast on is stuck in something here that is not a stitch. It's just the, where I tied the two ends together. So I'll just cut that and make it easy to pull that out. So you can get rid of the, the cast on yarn now. Okay. So now we're left with all these ends. In the pattern, I tell you to leave the very last tail ends really long. And before I move forward any further, I'm going to tie these together in a knot, just like I did with the other ends, so that it's super tight and there's no way it's, it can come undone. OK. These little tail ends here we'll weave in later. Now we're ready to work the Kitchener stitch, which is a way of grafting these stitches together that won't leave a ridge, it won't leave a seam, it's just invisible and beautiful. And I need a tapestry needle to work this, just a blunt-ended yarn needle. And you can use either color. It's going to be fine. I usually pick the one that's kind of facing the ends of the needles. I'll thread that on there. And if you worked every row of the pattern, and it's not that big of a deal if you accidentally skipped a row or something, but you're going to be starting <clears throat> at the center of the, of the circle and working Kitchener stitch out like this. And you want to have the right side facing you. The wrong side of the work is going to be folded over together inside. You have half your stitches on one needle, half your stitches on the other needle, and we're going to graph these together. So to set up, we're going to start off with um, a stitch on the front needle, a stitch on the back needle. This is just two setup stitches. I'm going to go in on the front needle as if to purl, and just leave that there. Jump to the back needle, go in as if to knit, and just leave that there. Okay, now we're actually ready to start the pattern repeat of the Kitchener stitch. We're going to work the first stitch, the second stitch on the front needle, jump to the back needle, work the first stitch, the second needle, second stitch on the back needle. So it's here, 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 here. And let me show you and then I'll tell you the little chant that I do while I work this to keep it in my head. Go in as if to knit. I mean, go in as if to knit is like this. Right? Knit, take that stitch off. 
and then go as in, in as if to purl on the next stitch. Jump over to the back needle, go as in, in as if to purl, off, go in as if to knit. Leave that there. And then, this isn't the case in every pattern, but in this pattern, you want to really pull on that yarn when you're finished to tighten it up. The tight, this, I have never recommended this before in a pattern, but the tighter the Kitchener stitch is in this pattern, the better it's going to look. Normally, you just want to keep good tension. Here, you really want to pull it. Okay, we're ready to work the four stitch repeat again. Knit, off, purl. Purl, off, knit. And that's what I say in my head while I do this. And then tug. Knit, off, purl. Purl, off, knit. Knit, off, purl. Purl, off, knit. And I'll, I'll write these instructions out for you in the pattern. The four stitch repeat. But if you can say knit off purl, purl off knit in your head, you'll have it. Okay. You don't have to watch me do the rest of this, but you can see I've been pulling this really tightly. That looks really good. I, I think I can show you an example here of how I learned, why I learned it's important to pull the Kitchener stitch super tight in this pattern. You see here, this is one of the first um, dishcloths that I made with the pattern that I finished, and you can see a ridge right here. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's nothing bad, it's not that noticeable, but there is a gap between the garter stitch purl bumps here where I worked the Kitchener stitch. And it's even and it's fine, but when I was um, experimenting with the pattern a bit more and I learned to really tug on that Kitchener stitch, um, I discovered that if you pull it really tightly, you can't see it at all. I couldn't even tell you where the end of this is. So that's why we do it. Okay, we're almost finished. Next up, we're going to learn how to tighten up the center hole to make it kind of invisible and how to weave in the cotton ends. We're just about finished. We're going to do some finishing work that's going to tidy things up and make sure that nothing's going to come unraveled when it's being machine washed and dried. Let's go ahead and take a look. Here's our finished circle, whether it's a dishcloth or a, a, a coaster or whatever, nobody knows. My sample here is actually wool, and I don't recommend that for a dishcloth because it can't be washed and dried. But I think what I'm going to do just for an experiment, I might felt this and see what I come up with, see what it looks like when it's felted. But for right now, we're demonstrating so um, it's full size and not felted yet. We have a pretty significant hole in the very center, and you can leave that there if it doesn't bother you, but I'm going to show you how to tighten it up. You have one of the long ends left from... Uh, when you finish the dishcloth, and it doesn't matter which color it is, because you used one end for the Kitchener stitch, and we just have the other end here. Now, since this is 12 segments, and every other segment is the purple color, what I'm going to do is grab a stitch at the base of each segment, or the point of each segment, in the purple. And then when I tighten that up, that will be enough to close it up. So my yarn's coming out of here. The first segment is here. 
I go from back to front, just grabbing a strand of yarn, pull that through, jump to the next segment in purple, back to front, just grabbing a stitch there, and the next one. And so I'm about halfway done. I am halfway done, so now I'll pull that tight. Look at it's almost closed now. Go to the next one, grab that one. I'll go around six times. And press down with your fingers and really pull it. Okay, totally closed up. It looks really good. Now let's talk about this end we have to weave in now. I'm going to poke this end through to the back and do all my weaving in back here. I want to weave in the blue ends into the area of work where it's blue and the purple ends into the area of the work where it's purple. And uh, I'm not going to do anything really fancy. All I'm going to do right now is get this purple end into some of the purple work somewhere. And I'm just going to grab the back of these stitches because I don't want it to show through on the front what I'm doing back here. If you're worried that it's going to show through on the front, just put your needle in and take a look. And if you can see the metal of your needle anywhere, you know it's going to show through on this side. Let's get myself over here. This is the technique that I use anytime I am using a machine washable yarn and I want to make sure that the knots are going to stay, the ends are going to stay woven in, and nothing's going to come unraveled. So I'm over here, I'm away from the very center, I'm into a purple area here, and I'm ready to do my little trick for getting this uh, really secure. You want to untwist the plies of yarn half and separate it half and half. This sample here is just a two-ply yarn, so separate it one ply and the other ply, okay? Re-thread the needle with one of those plies, or half of the plies, like the what I used here, this was a four-ply yarn, so I separated it two and two. And then move that one half of the plies just half a stitch away, just somewhere so that the two ends aren't coming out of the same spot. That makes it possible to tie these in another knot. And just like with the knots before when we were changing color, you want to pull this as tight as possible, just shy of breaking the yarn. I'm putting a lot of pressure on this. This wool will snap before a cotton will, but you get the idea. Once you do that, you can cut it really short, and then you can't even see that. It looks really good, and it's secure. And you'll do the same thing with all of these ends. And that's it. Those are all the techniques used in these. Um, like I said, the pattern includes instructions for different sizes, including pico edges and without pico edges. I'm really excited to see what you, what you all come up with. Good luck. We're just about finished. We're going to do some tidy finishing work that's going to, uh, it's going to be awesome. <laughs>